Good morning. Welcome to worship today as we continue in our worship series called Redirected. Today we see Jesus redirecting us when it comes to glory. There's the glory we pursue and the glory that is hidden in him and in the cross. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn 492, Son of God, Eternal. Our sermon text is going to be from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. It is printed again on page 9 in your worship folder so you can follow along. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He's, and he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What are you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. This is the word of our Lord. Dear Christian friends, what's the worst kind of kid-created mess that you've ever had to clean up? <laughs> I'm sure we all have our stories that can rival one another. Jesus' final encouragement in the verses before us brings us back to the perfect training ground for us as Christians, and that is the family. And that's on purpose, because it naturally translates over into the family of believers. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. To be honest, the world does not find much glory in serving kids. Any of the disciples would have gladly washed Jesus' feet if it were a choice between that and changing a poopy diaper or cleaning up a previously digested lunch that somehow got lost behind the bed. Kids are not naturally inclined to thank you for all that you do for them. It helps that they're cute, but we're always teaching them to say thank you, right? Say thank you. Say thank you. What do you say? Say thank you. Right? They don't always realize or even bring it to mind how hard you work every day to provide for the things that they so easily take for granted and just think are a normal part of life. Yet they expect everything from you. Jesus says to welcome them in his name. The disciples often felt that they had little time for children. And yet Jesus always had time for children. To welcome a child or anyone means to embrace them and all of the messes that they come with. It doesn't mean you have to approve of the messes or like the messes or think that they are fun to deal with. But welcoming them means embracing all of that. As parents, however, we are not always inclined to humbly serve them either. We're not inclined to humbly serve them without any acknowledgement, at least, or any praise in return. We want the accolades that are echoed on the shirt that says, world's number one dad or mom. 
But in the airport this last week, I saw a guy that had a t-shirt that said, world's okayest dad. And I'm like, can I just have that? That would be great. That's way more appropriate for me. Right, world's okayest dad. Jesus has just set the cross before his disciples again. Told them very plainly what he was going to do, what was going to happen. But notice their reaction in verse 31. It says, he said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Did you catch that? They were afraid. Why were they afraid to ask him about it? Perhaps they didn't want to ask him more about it, lest it pop the glorious dream that they were building in their hearts and minds. Finally, when they came to Capernaum, Jesus asked, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because they were kind of embarrassed. They were kind of ashamed. They kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Now, to be sure, Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking about, but he wanted them to admit it for themselves. And their silence betrays their continuously scheming hearts. They had something else on their mind entirely than what Jesus was going to do. There was a picture of glory that they had in their minds that they imagined what Jesus' kingdom would look like in this world and how it would practically benefit them. And finally, finally, they could have the respect and the honor that they wanted like never before. Finally, they could have they could have. Throughout their lives, this respect and honor after having been downtrodden in so many ways, they were longing for all of this to change. Now it was going to change, they thought. Now, to be fair, not too far back, Jesus had spoken about the disciples sitting on 12 thrones and judging the 12 tribes of Israel, meaning that they would stand as witnesses about Christ before all people in their public ministries eventually and especially in the final judgment. They would be there affirming to all who believe that, yes, Jesus is God's promised Savior. They would affirm the sacrifice that he would make and the victory that he would win. And even though now they barely understood it, they would stand ultimately as witnesses against even those who refused to believe God's promised Savior. They would even stand as witnesses against their own misconceptions about Jesus at this point. Sadly, when our sinful nature gets a whiff of glory, it can't stop. It needs more. The disciples started to give their hearts over to a competition for glory amongst themselves. And it was a silly display, to be sure. As James and John would eventually even call on their mother, the other Gospels tell us, to ask Jesus to place them in the highest positions in Christ's kingdom. And that move would only spill over into more infighting amongst the disciples. And it wasn't infighting to correct them, but because they all secretly were longing for the same thing, the same glory, and they didn't want it to be exposed in their hearts too. We can see the same fight inside ourselves, can't we? We want following Jesus and being his disciples to be glorious in this life. Right? We want it to look amazing. We want it to gain us respect and honor. We want to be lifted up in the eyes of others. It feels good to serve Jesus if it gains you practical glory and honor in this life. It is easier to serve those who can give us something in return, even if it's just appreciation. It's interesting how 
when the gifts given in a church can be higher than they've ever been in the history of that congregation. And at the same time, little lists like these are the hardest thing to fill out. Isn't that amazing? And don't be shocked because this happens all over the place. Brand new building, brand new landscaping, brand new remodel, whatever it is in whatever situation. And all of a sudden, just like that, little things like this become so, so difficult to do. It happens everywhere. And I know we're all just crazy busy. But did you ever notice that Jesus was never crazy busy? And that was on purpose. But that's a discussion for another time. Yet there's something deeper amiss here. Our hearts, by nature, just don't like to humbly serve. They just don't. It's just honest. Our hearts hate it. We don't like it, especially when it's a thankless job. And let's be honest, it is a thankless job, right? Garbage will always be left here and there, right? That's the way it will be. It will always be that way. And someone will always drop their brownie on the floor, and someone behind them will always step on it and walk away from it. That will always happen, right? We come with messes, right? We are, we are messy people inside and out. Someone will always spill their coffee somewhere. And after you just got done putting the carpet cleaner away and you think you got every spot, that's when you see another one, <laughs> right? That's the way it goes. Someone will always do something gross in the bathroom. But that's why we have bathrooms. Praise the Lord. And cute Little slobbery fingers and noses that God created will always be used to exploring the wonders of glass windows and doors and even drawing snot art on them. It's a beautiful mess. It's no different than cleaning up crumbs and messes in our own homes. I don't know how many times I sigh over all of the splashes and messes and roll my eyes and think, come on, right? And there I am grudgingly on my hands and knees muttering and murmuring and, and, and afterward looking for recognition and praise for an especially big disaster cleanup on aisle five. Oh, woe is me. Oh, woe is me. Oh, my time could be used doing something vastly more important receiving so much more glory than this. Really? Jesus redirects us. It says, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last. And the servant of all. The servant of all. This is when the disciples hear Jesus like the kids or adult, hear adults on Charlie Brown, right? So, you know, the disciples are sitting there, and Jesus is talking to them, and it's like, wah, 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 wah. So let me, let me translate that. It's servant of all. That's what he said. Servant of all. Don't misunderstand this either. Our hearts... Our hearts would love to take this and say, okay, I'll find ways to serve others so that I can be first in God's sight. Me first. And we thought we learned about that in kindergarten. Right? But here we are as grown adults, and we still have a hard time with it, right? Me first. Just like the disciples were struggling with the same thing. 
I want to be first. I want the honor and the respect before others. I want the glory. But do you know where the glory is hidden in all of this? It's not where you would expect. What happens when I, a sinner, with a wretched, sinful heart, try to serve others in a humbling way, like any of these things? What happens? Well, inevitably, it starts to fan my own pride and my own arrogance into flame. Even if I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job stifling it and fighting against it, you know what's true? It's still there. It's still there. It's the voice that says, I'm the only one or one of only a handful who care. And what does that reveal? Not that I'm gaining in God's books, to be sure. Perish the thought. No, there it exposes again. I can't even do something as simple as this. I can't even do something as simple as this with a pure heart that isn't lusting after some tangible glory that might come from it. It exposes all the more just how much I need Christ. Just how much I needed him to go and do all the things that the disciples were afraid to ask about at the beginning of our text. Just how much I needed Jesus, my substitute, to live the perfect life that I cannot. Just how much I needed him to serve others with perfect joy for his father. Perfect integrity when no one was looking. And perfect love for my neighbor. He did that. He did that. I've never done that. That's why I need him. And my whining and my complaining and my general avoidance of serving in such humble ways is proof that I needed him to do all of that for me. My eternity depends on it. And that, friends, is how on my knees, not in prayer, in front of an altar or anything like that, but that is how on my knees with wash rag in hand and toilet brush in the other hand, God lets me see the greatest glory. Not that I'm doing a gloriously humble job, not even that everything is sparkling clean or even that well cleaned, but the hidden glory in a broken heart that sees just how much I desperately need Jesus. Because even in such a simple thing, I cannot avoid pursuing glory. And it is that contrite heart that Jesus lifts up and puts back together and says, you're mine. You are mine. I know you by name. Through your baptism, you are cleansed. And then I start to see things as humble as cleaning and picking up trash, etc., whether at home or at church or in my neighborhood. When no one notices or seems to care, I see it all in a whole new light. You see, it's not humble service that gets me points with God, because even that is a Pharisee's errand. No, there in the very struggle that my heart has with serving others, there in that mess in my heart and my mind, Jesus covers that too in his holy precious blood so that I am saved and not condemned. There's the glory. There's the hidden glory. You know, I used to say that I would rather have people sign up to help with things like this and anything else only if if their heart was in it. 
only if it was truly a joy for them, so that it would be a joyful fruit of faith. And that's good, and I do believe that, but I don't think that's the entire story, and I don't think it's entirely correct by itself. Why not sign up for or do something that serves your brother or sister in Christ, your family or friends, even though you don't really like it? And no one seems to care or notice. Why not do that? Because even there, in the midst of that sinful mess in my heart that has me grumbling and bumbling and complaining the entire time, even in that sinful mess, which is far worse than anything I'm ever cleaning out of a toilet, God leads me to cry out, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Because what I see here is that I truly am a sinner. And there, in that broken heart, Jesus redirects our hearts from the fading glory that we've been desiring in this world to the lasting glory that now is hidden in him. He redirects our hearts away from how great of a servant I can possibly be to the servant that he alone was and is for me. You see, it's not about keeping a church clean. It's about Jesus cleaning us. Jesus purifying our hearts. Burning away the sin and the dross. Leading us to trust the forgiveness and the cleansing that he alone can give us. There in the most mundane and thankless tasks, he is able to reveal my sin the fact that I need him still more than I will ever like to admit. All of this so that I can see the glory of how he has saved a wretch like me. Even my sinful heart, he has forgiven. My friends, how can we stay outside and away from all of that when there's such a beautiful mess inside? Right in here, and in our own hearts and lives. An opportunity to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ, and an opportunity for Jesus to expose my own sinful heart and lift me up with the glory of his forgiveness for me still. What does his name mean after all? But he saves. Jesus came to love us, when, like the disciples, we neither knew nor understood the lengths to which he was going to go to save us. He came to save us from the mess that we made for ourselves before we ever even realized how bad it was. He came to save us from the messes still inside our own hearts every day, especially as we try to serve others and fall flat on our faces doing so. In fact, it is by the power of his name in all that he did to save us, that he has welcomed us into his kingdom. And trusting this, there is glory even in the mess inside my own heart, the glory that in him, I won't be this way when he raises me up in the end. You know, recently, I was with a fellow pastor on the board for home missions, and we were in Rapid City for a meeting, and a waitress there said to us that a couple weeks ago, she had gone to a local church in the area, and, and she said the pastor was great, the message was great, but the people, oh, the people. <laughs> oh, yeah. The people. If churches only weren't made up of people, right? And, of course, that's silly. <laughs> Churches wouldn't be churches without us people. With all of our messes, inside and out, there is that beautiful mess, the glory hidden in the midst of all of our messes, inside and out, the glory that Jesus took on the very nature of a servant and laid down his life to save even me and welcome me as his very own. Amen.
Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.